Hello everyone, I'm Rachel Lowe from Physiopedia and today I am talking to Lorinda Prinsloo. Hi Lorinda. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. Thank you so much for chatting to me today. Um, you are an occupational therapist in South Africa, um, so I'm yes. delighted to be talking to you from the other side of our planet. Um, before we, we're going to talk today a little bit about sort of occupational therapy intervention with in managing children with cerebral palsy. I'm sure we'll get on to lots of other topics as well. Um, but before we start chatting about those sorts of things, maybe you could just introduce introduce yourself um, and let us know a little bit about who you are and, and what you do, what sort of work you do. Okay. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm Lorinda Prinsloo. Uh, I live in Port Elizabeth in South Africa. Uh, I'm an occupational therapist. I qualified in 2005 and then subsequently I did my master's degree in early intervention. I'm very passionate about early intervention in general and specifically in cerebral palsy. I worked quite a few years in the government sector yeah, in South Africa, um, and I've been the program director of the Ambisela project at the Cerebral Palsy Association in the Eastern Cape for the past two years. Um, so we mainly work at care centers for individuals with cerebral palsy, and we focus a lot on training of caregivers, um, lay caregivers at the care centers, as well as parents. And we also do a lot of training of therapists, especially therapists starting out um, in the field. In South Africa, we have a year of community service. After you graduated, you have to work in the government sector wherever they place you. So a lot of these therapists get placed um, in areas where they are maybe one of two or the only therapist, and they have no experience with cerebral palsy. So we have a training um, course, a two-day training course that that we do with them as well, just to help and prepare them for um, for the community work with um, children with CP. Um, yes, and we are currently busy with an AAC project at our care centres. Uh, we were working on alternative and augmented communication with some of the children. And we are also hosting a general movement assessment training end of September here in South Africa, the first time that it's ever been in South Africa. So we're very excited about that. Yes, yeah, so that's in a nutshell what I do. So that's lots of things. That's lots of things to talk about. <laughs> So let's, yes. <laughs> yeah, let's pick up first of all, let, let's just talk about Hambacella first of all, the Hambacella yes. project, because we have been using your resources in this course, um, in our Managing Children with Cerebral Palsy course. Um, they're great um, resources. Um, can you just, just talk to us a little bit about those resources and sort of what's in them and how they should be used? Yes, so the Hambacella um, getting to know CP program was developed to train lay caregivers and parents in um, the therapeutic care giving of children with CP. Um, because we, in South Africa specifically, and I know a lot of other countries, there are not, there's not really a lot of resources available, especially in terms of the amount of therapists that you have available. So you need the caregivers and the parents to have basic skills to look after these children. So um, the original version was, um, it came out in 2008, but the most recent version was in 2010. So that is the original version, Hambisela. The original version had seven modules. Um, uh, which was introduction to cerebral palsy, and then evaluating your child, positioning, feeding, communication, everyday activities, and play. So they start, they started using the original version. Um, it's written in very simple language, so it's easy to use um, with people that don't have any medical background. 
and it uses a lot of, of pictures as well, which makes it easier to use. Um, you also get, there's also a parent manual that goes with, with the training um, resources that the parents get at the end of the training to help them to go back to some of the key points. So um, the original version was used, but they found that the parents were not really um, connecting with the info as they really wanted them to. So then um, the narrative version was developed in 2012. So the big difference there was that a story element was added um, where it uses a fictional family of a mom and her baby that is diagnosed with CP. And the story of this family is being told throughout the, um, the course, throughout the modules. Um, and each module, they will tell a specific part of the story that's relevant to that module. And um, the parents really started f feeling more comfortable to share their own stories because they could identify with the person in in this um, in this narrative. The only other difference was that they took out module two, evaluating your child, because they found that that was a bit too difficult for for the parents to use. So we do sometimes still use that module when we train nurses or community health workers, but for parents, we rather use the narrative version. So it's um, kind of, so yes. it's, it's like a resource that in particular is useful when you're training the parents and the caregivers. Yes, um, yes. Um, and do you use it, do you sort of just, and it's freely available, isn't it, online for anyone yes. to use. So, so when people, yes. if people wanted to use it, do they just download the whole resource and hand it to the parent or do they just spend some time going through them with it over different weeks or what's the, what's your best advice for, you know, actually delivering it to the parent or caregiver? So usually how we do it is um, we would do training over six weeks for the six modules. Yes, and there's a, there's a facilitator's manual that is freely available that actually tells the facilitator exactly what they need to do, when, what questions to ask. Then the parent manual is separate, and there's also a resource manual, which is, um, especially if you work at care centers, that's a very nice manual to leave the manager of the care center. Um, yes, yeah, so we have done it in a, like um, in two days, but we found it's it's too much information. So over six weeks is usually ideal. Okay, that's really nice. And I guess um, is this a really useful resource as well to use with the therapists that you train that haven't had any experience of of working with individuals with cerebral palsy before. Yes, uh, we would do our focus in the training would be a little bit different then. We would actually train them on how to use the the resources in their own communities. Yes, how, how they can use it with parents. So how they can use it to teach yes. the parents, yeah. Yes. Okay, so let me just ask this question. Why is it important to train the parents and the caregivers? Most of these children um, don't see therapists very often. If they're lucky, they might see one once a month. Um, and a lot of those times it might be a therapist that's not very experienced in CP. So they don't really get the input that they need. Where um, If you train a caregiver or a parent that sees the child every day, all day, and they use the principles that they are taught in in the the course, it's really it's we, we call it therapeutic caregiving. So it's things that they're already doing, but they're doing it in a therapeutic way. And we're trying to move away from the the um, traditional home program where you have to do these stretches twenty times a day. It's just it's very time consuming, and the parents don't have time to do that. They have other children at home, and then they feel guilty when they don't do that. Then they don't want to go back to see the therapist, so it's a vicious cycle. So we try to incorporate the therapeutic principles into everyday activities that they're already doing anyway. 
Okay, that's uh, perfect. That was perfect answer to that. It's, you know, it's quite <laughs> simple, and we probably all know that. But you know, I'm not I'm not an experienced therapist in this area by any means. So I like to ask these questions because if I'm asked, yes. thinking about them, then then other people will be as well. So you mentioned everyday activities and play, and incorporating yes. that sort of therapy into that. Can you? So let's talk about everyday activities and play. Yes. What? Um, how do you what's your advice about that how do you incorporate the therapy into everyday activities and play well usually what we would do is um talk to the to the mom or the caregiver the main caregiver and, and ask them what they might be struggling with a lot of times they struggle with dressing or bathing uh, um, brushing teeth toileting um you know all the basic uh, everyday activities and there are ideas for all of these activities actually included in the in module five which is everyday activities of the Ambicella course um, and then you would actually if if we have a small group of parents you can actually work individually with each parent and look at what how their child presents maybe it's a, a spastic quadriplegia so then that might make it difficult the, the the high tone can make it difficult for dressing so you can give some advice around that um, we look at a lot of positioning ideas and handling ideas um, that actually makes up most of the uh, that module to help the parents to know how to how they can handle the children during these everyday activities um, and then we also bring in other elements like uh, body concept um, and color concept, you know, especially the body concept during bathing, where instead of just quickly bathing the child, that they actually go through the body parts while they're washing, washing them. So incorporating small therapeutic goals into, into their everyday activities um, <clears throat> and trying to get the child to assist more rather than just being a passive receiver, especially if I can think of an example during dressing, rather than having the child lying on their back always when dressing, maybe try to have them sit up on a bench, or if they can, let them stand while you're putting on their pants. So we really encourage them to do small things like that to make the children more independent um, and ultimately then make the activity easier on the caregiver in the long run. And how, so the things that you've talked about there are, are, are all examples probably of everyday activities. Um, yes. Um, and, it, and it is, you know, it, the, it's important, or it's really nice actually that that we're moving away from the classic right now is your hour of therapy into bringing therapy into things that you're going to be doing anyway um, yes. with your child throughout the day. And I think that's really nice and it makes for a more consistent sort of yes. therapy, doesn't it? Um, yes. How does that um, transfer over into sort of the play environment? How would you encourage caregivers to do therapeutic play? Okay, so firstly, we actually just talk about what play is. And I think most caregivers and parents don't know that their children can play even if they are very physically disabled, that they actually still have the desire to play. So we first been, actually spend a lot of time um, just talking about that mind shift because as soon as you realize that your child wants to play, you will actually try and make more of an effort. Um, and then we talk a lot about low-cost toys as well. Um, Sometimes if if we have the opportunity we can we, we add a low cost toy making workshop as well. So we have a lot of ideas on low cost toys in um in that module as well. And not only things that you have to make, we, we try and let them see that there are things in the house that are already there that you can use in play. You don't have to buy expensive toys to be able to play. And actually just redefining play for them. Um, that play is not just playing with the ball outside. Play can be making eye contact with the parent and just actually having a bonding moment because some 
that's maybe that's all that that child can do at the moment. So, um, yes, so that's that's really the focus of, of our play is just actually redefining it and, and trying to get a mind shift uh, for them to see so they can see their children are just children. They they also they want the same things that other children want. They don't they don't just want to lie in the corner and be fed and bathed. They want to interact as well with the environment and with their with their parents. Okay, and so so I'm so what we've been talking about here is is kind of um, working with the individual well the child with cerebral palsy individual with cerebral palsy in the sort of home environment with their everyday activities yes. what, how does that and that and how we can bring therapy into all of that into the play and everyday activities what about for the people who are have a higher level of functioning um and uh, what are your thoughts on those with high level of functioning whose everyday activities and play may include going to work and being in a sports team or something what what are yes. your what would your advice be or what sort of knowledge can you share around that hmm, that is a good question i don't really usually work a lot <laughs> with those people um but um it it is very important to have an inclusive community um where there are opportunities for activities like this for people with disabilities. Um, our local university, for instance, has a disability unit that they are focused on making in, making classes accessible and things like that. So I think at, at that higher level, it's really, if something like that isn't available, I really, I do feel that it's, the people that work in the field, it's our duty to try and advocate for things like that. Um, that to make higher education more accessible, to um, to make re uh, make leisure activities more accessible. Um, yes, because there are a lot of higher functioning people with CP that that can work in the open labour market, um, but don't ever get the opportunity because of accessibility issues, which is a totally different thing um, to talk about as well. Um, but I do feel that it, it is our duty to um, to advocate for, for these things if it's not available. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> I'm sure we, you know, we all have a role in, in helping people to sort of optimise their functioning, don't we, in daily mm. life. Um, so, so you're. So, what I want to ask you about now is, you're an occupational therapist, um, yes. and um, how? I'm a physiotherapist, so this yes. is yeah. Uh, there's a lot of physios on these courses because just the net, the nature of of our project. Um, it say it seems to me talking to you like the role of the occupational therapist and the physiotherapist is quite similar in working with individuals with cerebral palsy. Yes. Can you just talk about how that sort of works? How do we work together? Are we the same in this situation? Are there differences? You know. Well, I think we, there's a lot of overlap between the OT and the physio when working with um, individuals with CP. But um, I can now say from personal experience, we, we've we been only two OTs on our project for a year and a half. And we now recently um, added a physiotherapist as a locum. Um, and it's been amazing to see just the, the different focuses that we have. Um, what I found with physiotherapists is their knowledge of anatomy and kinesiology is really very, very good. And there are things that they can do that we can't do, like the breathing, um, you know, things that we were never taught. Things uh, like and what? Then, things like what? Like, um, like listening to the breathing and taking that into account with your positioning. Um, like I, I won't be able to listen to the breathing and actually know what I'm listening for. And that was one big thing that, that's been a big asset to us now. 
is to actually look at the physiological effects of positioning um, on, on that level that we weren't able to do before. Um, so that's what I found with, the, with having the physiotherapist is um, really being able to um, dissect the movement um, and the posture and actually see exactly where the problem lies. But I think with, with, with your occupational therapist, we have a more holistic, big picture view. So um, our focus is obviously very functional, which the visual therapist, the focus is also very functional. But it, it feels to me that we work together very well um, because the visual therapist really has those skills to go in and really dissect the things and the, the OT sort of looks at, okay, how is this going to affect the play, the everyday activities? So essentially you you can get away with just having a fissure or an OT because not everyone is fortunate to, enough to have both. But I really do feel that we, we have different ends, we put a different emphasis on our um, treatment and it really helps if you have both in your team. Yeah, nice. It's really interesting that you've noticed that bringing a, a physio onto the team recently. Um, so, mm, but yes. that, and I think that just, it does highlight, as you say, it just highlights how important it is for us to work together um, with the interdisciplinary team uh, environment if if indeed it's available to, yes. to the individual. Um, yeah. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about, well, we've talked quite a lot about play, activities of daily living, um, um, and things later on in in life. I, well, I imagine, well, not later on in life, but those sorts of things. Um, now, I know that your some of your expertise is in early intervention. Um, so before we we go, I'd just like to um, talk to you a little bit about that have, and see if you can share some of your knowledge with us about, because your master's was in early yes. intervention, wasn't it? So. Yes. So I guess what kind of, around early intervention, what are the important messages that we could take away from the knowledge that you have? Well, um, the first big thing is that uh, the diagnosis of CP is actually made quite late still through, throughout the world, uh, usually only around 18 to 24 months, which sounds very early, but there are really a lot of very important neural processes happening within the first 24 months that we miss out on if we only start our in intervention after two years. Um, so we are looking at the moment, we, we are trying to start a early intervention or early identification project rather in South Africa um, where we are bringing in the general movement assessment. Um, Brechtel's general movement assessment where you can actually identify CP in infants between 9 and 20 weeks of age. So we're very excited about that. Um, that's end of September we are we're doing our first training in the basic um, the basic course in GMA. So the repercussions of that would be if we can identify CP earlier, we can refer them for services earlier and we would really be able to make use of those neural processes within the first 24 months. Um, I actually just did training last week on, on early intervention in CP for a couple of therapists at our local hospital. And um, one, of the, one of the big things is we, we want to try and move away from the milestone um, way of thinking of saying, okay, the child must first sit and then crawl and then stand. It's, it doesn't always work like that with, for children with CP. Now, I am an OT, so crawling is like very important. You know, OTs are always known for hammering on about crawling. Um, but we do get sometimes get stuck on a milestone. And um, very good advice that I got from an uh, um, advanced baby course that I did was to not focus on the milestone, but to separate the kinesiology from the milestone. See what that baby would be learning in that phase and then use that in an age-appropriate way. So I think what happens a lot of times is we as therapists get stuck, especially a lot of the, with the crawling and the sitting, and we just spend all of our time on that. 
And in the meantime, the child's actually getting older and it's not age appropriate anymore for the child to be crawling on the floor. So um, being age appropriate, chronologically age appropriate in your activities is actually very good advice I can give generally in early intervention. Don't um, keep a two-year-old on the floor. Try and get him to stand, even if it's an equipment. If you want to work on the crawling motion, let him climb on something rather than trying to crawl on the floor, if that makes sense. Um, yes. Yes, so that's, I think that's very basically like that. that is good advice that I can give to someone that's working in, in early intervention with, with kids with CP. And if we get them early, we can prevent a lot of deformities that we sit with later on in life. Um, so rather, don't, don't feel that it's too early to start. Even if you're not sure what to do, try and read up, talk to people that know what to do, but don't send them away because you don't know what to do. Okay, good. That's really useful. I think, um, I think, um, yeah, that ties in well with what we learned in week two, I think. Um, yes. So nice messages to be reinforced at this stage in the course and um, for us to think about when we're, because, you know, at this stage, if we're thinking about working with children with cerebral palsy or disabilities, if we're seeing these people coming in, it's really useful for us to um, be able to help with that early intervention, mm. the early identification, um, and, and sort of intervene appropriately um, more effectively at those early stages. So great advice there. Um, so is there anything else? We've talked a lot about, we've talked about early intervention now and about other OT, physio, activities of daily living, play. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with the participants of this course before we call it a day today? Um, I think the only thing I want to still add is that working with the children with CP is sometimes, it's, it's very hard work, but it's really very rewarding. And just to keep at it, if you feel you don't know what you're doing, reach out to someone because it, it really is very rewarding. Don't feel that you don't know what you're doing, you're going to give up, um, yeah, we, we need therapists that are passionate about CP. Yeah, that's that's it for me. Yeah, I think that's perfect. I think it's really important, actually, that to feel like you're not alone if you're, you know, because it's a yes. it's a unique environment in some places and a unique sort of set, sort of group of individuals to be working with and you you probably could be really lonely in that situation yes um especially if it's just sort of you're the one therapist for a huge area or something um and it's not your special clinical area but um yes. but there are people out there to reach out to and i'm sure you yes. know you'll meet a lot of people on this course we're all you know we'll develop some a great network on this course so so i think yes. that's really good advice you know don't don't feel alone um, there's a lot of people out there in the yes. same situation um, and if we all talk to each other then we can make a huge difference to children's lives which is what we're all after so really nice yes. message okay well thanks very much Lorinda I think um, we we will be sharing the Hamburg documents for everyone or links to them for everyone to use yes. um, and we'll also you've been in the forums already probably um, <laughs> we will uh, you'll be around in the forums particularly in week yes. five hopefully to have a chat to everyone answer some questions around um, everyday activities and play which will be great yes. so thanks so much for chatting to us today it's been great to talk to you Thank you. Thank you for having me.